The future of work isn't about shareholder value, technology, metrics, or automation. It's about being human and putting people first through actionable love. Welcome to the Love in Action podcast, where we hold deep conversations with extraordinary people to help you grow as a leader and expand your business. Here's your host, Marcel Schwantes. Hey, welcome to another episode of the Love in Action podcast. Glad you are here. Hey, please don't forget to subscribe so that you don't miss an episode. And as always, we would be grateful if you could leave us a positive review on iTunes. So we're doing something a little different this morning. I have decided to bring on a co-host for the show. And who else to co-host this show than my good friend, and somebody that we've had on the podcast a gazillion times by now, Rob Holman is here. Rob, welcome. Hey, you know <laughs> I'm so excited about this, Marcel. I've been on your show a number of times. You and I have become great personal friends, have a lot to share about life and leadership. So are you kidding me? This is When you mention this to me, I'm like, I'm already there. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a lot to talk about, but we also have a short window to do it. Because we're going to bring in our, our guest later, and that is Seth Goldenberg. I will be chatting with Seth soon. So, Rob, we're, you know, whenever I bring a co-host, and I've only done this once before, the idea is just kind of introducing a, a leadership topic for discussion that is aimed at helping our audience to become better leaders. And you had something that kind of struck you in, in an article that you read. Tell us about it. I sure do. And I think it couldn't be a more relevant and timely topic. It has to do with well-being. Mm. You know, when we hear that word well-being, it's is our being well? Are we really well? It was a based off a an article that uh the columnist uh quoted a Deloitte survey that revealed Marcel, when you hear this, revealed 70% of executives are considering leaving their jobs right here and right now, like in this season, in this time period, for workplaces that care more for their well-being. Well, hold on a second. You probably think it like, hold on. These are executives. These are C-suite execs. They're the ones calling the shots. They're the ones arguably with greater influence and impact in the organization. And they're thinking about jumping ship. Hold yeah. on a second. But not just that. Same study says that 57% of employees outside of management roles want to quit for similar reasons. Yeah, yeah. So hold on, 70% of the C-suite execs, 57% of employees or team members want to leave for their well-being. So it has me at least put on the table for a little dialogue with you and I today. Okay. So if people want to jump ship based on their well-being, there's a whole lot of cultures out there that aren't healthy that aren't caring for people's human beings as much as they are working professionals and people want to leave because of it. Yeah. And I think, and one of the things I want to get your take on is, you know, the temptation, I wonder if you agree with this. The temptation is, okay, well, yeah, this workplace isn't suitable for me because I don't feel like I'm cared for. So I want to go into another work environment where I believe it will be. But do we really understand what well-being is? Do we really understand what makes us well, how we define it. Because if we take a, a deeper look within first, then we're going to see, does my current place of employment, is that an alignment or is there a better culture that's better suited for me based on my well-being? So it's almost like pushing the pause button first to see some things about ourselves. Yeah. What do you say? Okay. So lots of things are swirling in my head right now. Um, oh, the, and one of them is I'm equally shocked that uh, it's the executors that are 70% of the ones, because to me, it's the executors that kind of set the stage for creating the environment for well-being, right, across the organization. But they're the ones that are saying, hey, I'm jumping ship because this is not a place that is, that is, is caring for my well-being. That's alarming to me. I don't know if that means that they are inheriting a a culture of toxicity prior to them arriving and that's just the way it is i don't know uh and so uh, so that's that's shocking to me but i think you're on to something about what exactly is well-being because since covid hit um you know we've had this burnout epidemic now because people can't turn off their devices and 
in that that whole line of work life is now so blurred that uh, you know it's like people are overworking. So I mean, yeah. in your so give me your impressions of what in your words what what is well being. Well, I think we need to take a look at it holistically. I think um, now I, people might be listening to this being like, hold on, Rob, you're about to think holistic. I just need to stay professional here. Well, yeah. But we take ourselves with us wherever we go. How can we not think holistically about who we are, about what matters most to us? So case in point, I th- when I think of well-being, Marcel, I think of physical, spiritual, emotional, mental. There's so many aspects that make up who we are. And I think I think if we're completely honest, so many workplace environments, so many leaders within the workplace, we tend to focus a bit more on the working professional, right? We tend to, you know, let's meet the goals. Let's make sure those goals are accomplished. Let's make sure that that professional development track for our people is in, it's in place and it's being massaged and it's being tweaked, et cetera. But I think what we're not doing probably a good enough job in, in, are we caring about that team member? Are we caring about ourselves yeah. as a leader, as a human being, even more so than the title, the responsibilities that follow, the tasks associated with the project or the goal at hand? So for me, it requires almost stepping back 30,000 square foot view for a moment to say holistically, What does it mean for me to be well physically, emotionally, spiritually in my life? And how can that best be nurtured in the workplace? Okay, that's good, because now it makes sense, Rob, why 70 percent would be saying that, because some of them may not know that they're not taking care of themselves. They're just plowing ahead, you know. And and having to meet all kinds of stakeholder expectations. I mean, they're just CEOs. Yeah. They, yeah. you know, the, That's right. the the whole company is riding on their shoulders. But I think that so many of them, it, it might be a blind spot that they're not even. It's not even in their on their radar to say I need to put myself for my well being first, mm-hmm. and and but then but then spread that out across the organization as sort of a as a you know as a a cultural trait or. Uh, what's the word that's, uh, you know, a habit, a practice, a yeah. um, a value, right? A ritual. Like, so if you're mm-hmm. going to um, sort of spread the gospel of well-being across your organization and you're the CEO, what healthy habits do you want other people to, you know, to to employ and, 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 and partake in, you know, under your roof? I mean, uh, so to me, that's kind of a good starting point. Start with you. What are your blind spots? Okay, yep. if, if you're talking about holistic, you mentioned four: emotionally, physically, uh, so uh, what was it? Spiritually. Spiritually, yeah, yeah. And I mean, I might even go as far as saying financially. We're I love that heading point. into a yeah. recession, inflation, financially, people are barely able to to meet their needs now because a lot of companies aren't. Um, aren't providing in that financial sense, right? To to yeah. so that take that is uh, has a lot to do with the well being because hey, if I'm stressing about paying my bills next month, you better believe it. It's going to have a, an impact on my emotional, spiritual, physical, you name it, health. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, and and I think you know I want to get back to something that you know it's my heart, it's my inside out leadership philosophy that we can only give what we got as leaders, for instance, right? So in other words, if we want our people, we want our team members, we want our employees to be on point with their well-being, guess where it starts? It starts with us as the leader. Yeah. So are we putting time in our schedule, time blocking, time for us? Hold on, Rob, Marcel, there's too much for me to do. There's too much demand, too much responsibility, too many goals to knock out. I get you. I got you. Listen, you're hearing from a type A type A guy right now. Yeah. But I believe so much in the value of well-being and all that it means, all that was required of me, so much to where I'm disciplined to work it into my calendar on a very specific basis, physically, emotionally. You know, we can get into that, Marcel, with what that looks like for, for you and I, how we care for ourselves. Yeah. But nonetheless, when we're committed to it, because let's let's be real for a moment. 
whatever we believe in or believe have tremendous value, we'll see it through. It's whether or not we believe it has value, it has merit. Because a lot of times we're like, well, I'm too busy. I can't do that. I got to take care of other people. But no, no. If we believe we must take care of ourselves more effectively so that we can care for others much more effectively, then we're actually going to find time in our busy, crazy schedules to get alone, to do the things that we enjoy, to make sure our cup is overflowing. Because at the end of the day, people begin to get what you have. They begin to get what you what you got, as I like to say. So if you're living in and out of a place of well-being, guess what? People in your midst and within your sphere of influence are going to begin picking that up, picking out, picking up and out your purpose, your passion, your enthusiasm. Not because you should be that positive person, but because you are yeah. that positive, passionate person. So if we were to boil this down into just one concluding statement for me, I mean, I think you you, you nailed it. It starts with leaders. Leaders have to be able to model what they want to see in their organization. And I hope that they want to see healthy, engaged, uh, you know, motivated people working for them. But you have to be able to, to take care of them in order for them to produce at a high level. And taking care of them means taking care of their well-being. But don't forget, we ba are backing up to who the leader is first to model those behaviors themselves, right, to take care of themselves first. So, you know, the old adage, you know, put the oxygen mask on on you first right. before you put it on the uh, person next to you. So take care of yourself first. And uh, and there are various ways. We don't have enough time to cover that. Various ways that you can, you know, start to 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 do that. Take care of your own needs first and then being able to model that for others around you. Does that sound like um, a, a good summary? Fun. How would you summarize this? Totally, 100% agree with you. You know, I may also share in addition that I believe a thought-provoking question uh, that's going to have leaders take a look deep within may be this. What are my personal priorities in this season of my life? And think holistically. Mm. Spiritual, emotional, physical, family, you know, workplace. What? are my specific priorities? In other words, by answering that question, that's not something we could just answer right away. That requires us to take some time alone, to be reflective, be present, be a bit futuristic perhaps as well, but really soak in the people and the things that matter most. That's awesome. And more so, I, I believe that when we take the time to do that, we're caring for ourselves first. Mm. And then out of that place, our eyes are open. Our heart is leaping a bit more for who we are, a bit more for those around us, and a bit more for the work that we do. Love it. Boom. Let's end it right there. That's Rob Holman. He is my co-host. Rob, if people want to get a hold of you, how can you do that? Yeah, best way to do it is my personal website, and that is robholman.com. I'm going to have more of Rob Holman in future episodes where we're going to do a little bit of co-hosting. So stay tuned for that. And stay tuned for my guest, Seth Goldenberg. I'm going to be right back. Hang tight. Hey, leaders and managers, Marcel here. You know, I got this leadership development course out right now, and it's getting fantastic reviews. So I want to tell you a little bit about it because it might be for you. It's called From Boss to Leader. And it teaches emerging leaders and managers those servant leadership skills, the, the everyday stuff that you need to inspire, engage, and motivate your team for high performance, you know, to get bottom line results. Now, we're not just taking anyone for this course. We want to make sure that you're truly invested in your growth as a servant leader. So if you'd like to explore whether this, this experience is really for you or your team of managers, Visit my website right now, marcelschwantes.com, and click on training. Today, we welcome Seth Goldenberg, author of Radical Curiosity, Questioning Commonly Held Beliefs to Imagine Flourishing Futures. I love the title. I love this topic. And I, I think curiosity in this day and age is, you know, with everything becoming so politicized, and people hunkering down in their left-right trenches. You know, folks, 
I'll be honest with you. I think curiosity is kind of becoming extinct, which is unfortunate because without curiosity, we don't see what's possible in experiencing breakthroughs in, in conversations or, you know, reconnecting with those who have disowned us, or maybe we're the ones that disowned them because they didn't fit with our particular belief system. So we stopped asking questions. We stopped being curious. I'm afraid, folks, that we've arrived at the point where we, we can't come to the table for healthy, productive dialogue. We'd rather just, you know, lob grenades at each other. This is crazy to me. Choosing to entrench ourselves in our own ideologies and listening only to our own voices inside our heads when we, we could explore possibilities with curiosity and listening non judgmentally and, and grow our self awareness, you know, and come to the, come to the middle and, and to heal and reconcile friendships with families, coworkers, loved ones. So, and because this is a business podcast, now I'm going to, Bring the business aspect of it, okay? And in, in leadership, without curiosity, we limit ourselves to what we already know. And, you know, that may be a very small world that will keep you stuck and keep you from growing. So what happens is it without curiosity, we stifle innovation and we stall change. You know, we take action thinking it's the right thing to do before asking questions and getting many perspectives. And then sometimes we make really dumb decisions because of that. So I'm hoping that by bringing in Seth to the show, we can learn to reignite our curiosity and build better relationships, build better organizations, but ultimately build a better world. We really need that right now. So who is Seth Goldenberg? He is the founder and CEO of Curiosity and Company, a one-of-a-kind bookstore, experience laboratory, and Design Ventures Studio. And he's also the creator of the Ideas Salons, invitational thought leader retreats that tackle the essential questions of our time. Seth has been stimulating curiosity with clients from Apple, Disney, American Express, GE, to leverage the power of questions and rewrite narratives that no longer serve us, redesigning social systems around how we will live learn, work, play, and sustain ourselves. Seth now joins us. Welcome to the Love in Action podcast. Well, thank you so much for having me. Wow. I love, yeah. I love your energy. It's so good. Thanks, Seth. I appreciate that. Seth and I have been kind of talking offline a little bit, and I was telling him that this is a, a topic that uh, it hits close to home because we are experiencing the, the, the very things that I mentioned in my introduction, Seth. And uh, so I can't wait to dive into this. But before we dive in, Seth, we have a kickoff question for listeners to get to know a little bit about you. Are you ready? Absolutely. Let's jump <laughs> in. What's your story, man? <laughs> I like it when you deliver it that way. That's great. Well, I, I began as an artist, as a painter, actually, an oil painter. Uh, I was... Uh, blessed with uh, some innate talent. And I was exhibiting my artwork in galleries professionally by the age of 11. And so I always had the ability to see and make imagery. Uh, but as that became a professional practice, I, I went to school to be a painter. I went to Rhode Island School of Design, RISD, to be an artist. The traditions of creative education were very isolating. Mm. And I found myself to be, I learned of myself, that I needed social interaction. I needed civic engagement, collaboration, teams. And so I kind of reinterpreted a creative life. And I moved from art to design, to cultural organizations, to business. And for me, if you look at my resume, my story, my, it looks like a zigzag. I'm, I'm in banking and climate change and education. It doesn't make any sense. It, it, you know, it, it uh, refuses a sector or an industry specialization. But I think the through line is really what I uh, decided to focus this first book on, which is about how to ask great questions. Mm -hmm. For me, that is 
that is the essence of a creative life. And no matter what encounter, and I tried to share some of my most um, unique encounters in my life in the book, but it always came back to seeing, hearing, and proposing new kinds of inquiries. At what point though, did you have a pivotal moment where something just kind of st struck you where the journey began towards writing this fascinating book? I mean, w was there a, a sort of that pivot point? Well, the book in particular uh, began, ironically, prior to the pandemic. Uh -huh. uh, I, I was invited to codify my design studio's practice after being blessed with extraordinary projects working with Oprah Winfrey or Barack Obama's launch or Apple as you share we've had we've been privileged to be either in the driver's seat or in in the room as where it happens as Hamilton might say right yeah. and i think uh at that point the book was meant to almost propose is there a practice after design thinking because design thinking especially in business leadership has kind of peaked out and i think a lot of us are seeing the limits of design thinking but actually the arrival of the pandemic gave me greater courage to write a book that was a much broader interdisciplinary cultural philosophy book and part memoir to be able to say yes there's something after design thinking but it's not about the new buzz term it's not about the new six sigma it's actually something much more timeless and that's when i really decided to leap with some courage because of the existential threats we face with the pandemic yeah so speaking of buzz terms and you know cliches and all that uh you know radical curiosity could be deemed as one so let's define in your own words what do you mean by radical curiosity yeah thank you i mean I appreciate uh, how when you when you open, you highlighted the the subtitle, which for me acts as at least the beginning of an operating definition, right? So radical curiosity really is about asking questions mm. uh, in order to kind of challenge the commonly held beliefs in order to be able to kind of break free and imagine a new alternative and and future state that I talk about as flourishing. But I think just to decode it for you and, and your audience, for me, I, I love this term radical, because I think very quickly we go right into curiosity. It feels very familiar, right? Um, but radical as a term, I'm very interested in etymological roots of language. It's part of my own curiosity practice to go back and look at language. And radical comes from a Latin term that really means the roots of things okay right? it's not a kind of passive curiosity radical curiosity seeks to really excavate the very essential elements of how we see the world and that is a kind of aristotle first principles kind of practice to really kind of peel back the layers to the onion it's not how do we move hmm. into integers or commodities or transactions but what do we really mean by the human condition? You name my five favorite terms. What does it mean to live? What does it mean to learn? What does it mean to play? These basic human condition questions. We tend to not visit these. We tend to not confront these. And I think they're actually the greatest source of value creation. I love that you mentioned the root or at least the, the, the original meaning of the word radical, right? As the root of things, because think about it it's and and then you use curiosity so radical curiosity now it it, it forces us to have to go deep because when you talk about roots you know if you're in the garden if you got to go dig down into the roots right right for this conversation we are losing the ability to to be able to face people and problem solve together by getting to the core or the roots of a problem and and you see the premise of the book is really to ask questions and we're we're not doing that so <laughs> it, 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 so to sound the alarm right? it, it, this is yeah uh, right. seriously it is like the uh, the bells are going off right in my head so when i think about 
this book and and what you have discovered and all that. So tell me about tell tell us what's holding us back from doing that, from being curious, from asking questions, and from digging down into the roots to find the source of our problems. Yeah, yeah. It's I mean that is the the question, right? That is the thesis, and uh, you know I wonder if it's it's not as though there's a single silver bullet that if we only had this Lego block and we removed it, all you know gorgeousness would. <laughs> I do think that uh, there, there's a variety of variables, and they are unfortunately at this stage systematic. Right? It's mm-hmm. not a it's not a situational or a variable that you could just navigate. It is intrinsic. But I think, you know, one way I think about this that might be useful is that we often get distracted by the how, the tactical, what I and my studio team call the vehicle. Okay. So all of our days as business managers and organizational leaders are often consumed by managing the tactics of how we do what we do. But we very rarely, and you and I had a good conversation briefly about this, go further upstream as to why are we doing it in the first place? Mm. And I'll give you an example. You know, I often tell a silly, it's like an anecdotal story, right? Uh, It's a made up microcosm, but it represents the organizations I've worked with. Often we'll get uh, a call or get engaged by a Fortune 100 corporation, an extremely well-known brand, and they'll say, oh, we'll give this, this example. We've heard about this new trend called the Internet of Things. We're so excited about being a part of the Internet of Things, but we don't really know exactly what it is. It's new. It's emerging. Why don't we bring a bunch of smart people together? We'll hold a conference or a symposium. We'll figure out what the Internet of Things are. All right, so now there's a working group. Then there's a committee. Now you're planning the date. And all of a sudden, your assignment is to manage the parking for who comes to the meeting in which we might figure out what the hell Internet of Things is even about. And we we do this. We allow for the sliding to kind of go seven degrees of Kevin Bacon (laughs) <laughs> far away from the origin point of why did we even start this to begin with? Right. And it's as though the modern organization, especially considering what you've shared with me about your audience, we need to kind of check ourselves and say, have we designed organizations to be management enterprises of tactics of which we have literally eradicated the inquiry of why out of the equation? Can I give you another one? Yeah, okay, I want to throw this in because you, yeah. you touched on it lightly in the book, but I want you to expand on this. Mm-hmm. This whole DEI movement, diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's a cool thing. And yes, we should be more equitable organizations. Of course, we need to be more diverse and all that. But a lot of organizations are just doing it as a as a check the box thing, not really understanding why they're doing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good one. I mean, we were privileged to work with uh, the Apple stores globally at a time when, uh, even before, uh, I would say almost 10 years ago now, when DEI was uh, still emergent, not as um, almost, let's call it mainstream as the discourse is now. And we did some really important work around that that deep discourse and mental model exercise around why do we believe in this? How can we lay out a discipline and rigorous understanding as to our intent, how we define success, why we're even interested in it in the first place, and to do some often very vulnerable work that is about both us and our identities, but also how we reimagine how a cultural organization, whether it's for-profit or non-profit, uh, can be organized around shared values and what the de- design of an organization looks like when it exemplifies those values. And I agree. I think what's happening is, uh, it's not, and, and I'm, I'm one of the biggest advocates uh, for DEI, I think the 
the question I ask, not of the practitioners necessarily, because I think actually many of the most avant-garde and pioneering practitioners, they see it as absolutely a radical, talk about the roots of things, a radical curiosity practice. I think when the institutions become these 200,000 employee entities or governments that have you know millions of individuals and hundreds of departments, it can very easily and very quickly get diffused as to the origin and clarity of the intent and how that flows into the bloodstream. And that's that's a kind of uh that's a question of uh it's an essential question of the kind of human condition yeah. that that we believe in. I just want to conclude by saying, you know, I actually believe, I love that you brought up uh, kind of some of the language of the opening um, uh, thesis of the book that uh, curiosity is an endangered species. I, I think to add to that, which relates, I think quite fundamentally to the DEI question is that I believe that the crises of our times hmm. are not commercial. They are not technological or even scientific, but they are fundamentally humanistic. And what I mean by that is we don't have an inability to make money or value. We don't we have ungodly technological tools and the medicines and the sciences that we have available to us are extraordinary. I yeah. think even though things at times as you say like there's some tension, we're not talking, our capability of solving problems is extraordinary. It's the human messy stuff that we're really still struggling with, right? It's not, well, I wonder if we could end hunger. We can. We just have to decide to and organize and decide what we value and what we care about in order to bring that into practice. That's a human enterprise. Yeah. Yeah. So this human enterprise of um, becoming more polarized do you think that is there one underlying factor as to why we don't talk anymore? Can you pinpoint exactly? Is it is it because the things have become so politicized that we are choosing to go into our corners? Or is there something else going on? Well, I think related to this thread where, where you know, it's almost like if you think of, I mean, as, as a designer, I can't help myself, right? There's a particular kind of design mind of how we look at challenges and opportunities. And, you know, we can't help ourselves. We, it's almost like a doctor. Every, everything a doctor sees is a diagnosis opportunity. Yeah. We go, oh, that's for us as designers, we go, oh, that's a design project. That's a good design. Right? But, you know, I think it's almost as though in the West, let's just talk about the Western canon or America in particular. The project of the 20th century was a capitalistic project. The project that we went to work on was to increase our extraordinary ability to produce and systematize capacity for living, right? Yeah. And so it's almost as though, you know, the t that that list I gave, right? Science and technology and commercialism for me are not the issue. In some ways, because we we've, we've done quite well, right? And in some ways, radical curiosity is a 21st century upgrade of the history of philosophy, right? Philosophy is a practice of asking questions. Philosophy is a love of man, a love of thinking. And so it's almost as though we've over-indexed on production, our ability to make technologies, and we've under-indexed on the humanities, the philosophy, the cultural work of what should we do with these amazing tools we just invented? Mm. Mm. We, we went further on our ability to make this magic, but we didn't have a conversation about should we? What would it mean? What is our responsibility? And so you hear about like, ethics and philosophers being employed by Silicon Valley, where suddenly Silicon Valley is even becoming aware of their own addiction they've created in terms of yeah. screen time and all these things. Well, they're bringing the humanities back in because it's almost like, whoa, we overcorrected. Now we need to kind of bring that uh, that back on rails and bring humanities into it. So, you know, when you say with your question, I guess I, I wonder if part of what we need to embrace 
is uh, a kind of new renaissance that is not necessarily the STEM renaissance, the science, technology, engineering, math, that we have that capability. We may need a curiosity kind of renaissance to ask new questions about now that we could do anything, as one of my colleagues and mentors said, Bruce Mao, now that we could do anything, what should we do? What will mm. we do? What's worth doing? Yeah, yeah. So I want to flip the script to understanding how to be, become more curious. So I guess the first question is really, I mean, some people may think that they are not naturally wired to mm -hmm. become curious. Mm -hmm. Can it be taught? Can it, and can you improve on it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think it's also like saying uh, when we are born, do we automatically know how to breathe? <laughs> right? Like, do, do, do children come with IKEA instructions on breathing? Well, <laughs> I believe curiosity is an innate capacity in all of us. To your point, you know, I mean, I, I mentioned to you, I, I began as a painter. A lot of people are like, oh, I can't draw a straight line, right? Oh, creativity was reserved for other people. I mean, the wonderful thing about curiosity is we are all born capable of being curious, just like breathing. Now, at the same time, there's a great now practice around the well-being lifestyle exercises of how to make breathing more present, how to refine it and how to utilize it for its greater superpower. I feel the same thing about curiosity. We can immerse ourselves in certain practices that better bring it forward. And there's very practical things. I mean, uh, uh, at the end of the book, uh, there are 28 building blocks. Some of the, It's almost like somewhere between a vocabulary list and a little uh, set of uh, practices that we've been uh, kind of in incubating here in my studio, but they range from how to take walks. Yeah. How do we immerse ourselves in nature? Forest bathing, this kind of Japanese original idea that is becoming more and more present. People are becoming more aware about literally how they feel or the neuroscience impact of being immersed in nature. And I have a section you probably, you probably noted, Imagine that walking has become a radical act, right? To saunter, to wander. It's a waste of time, right? <laughs> Steve Jobs used to hold his most important meetings as walking meetings around yeah. the campus, right? Yeah. And part of the book, I pull some research about, let's not just let this be woo-woo and just kind of, oh, only Steve Jobs. There's really great science and knowledge about what is happening there. How do we synchronize with another person when we walk with them, both physiologically, emotionally, and I call it also trust walking. Mm. I tell a story about I was working with a community in northern Canada that was looking at the future of climate change and sustainability in a place in the world that is a big issue. And I talk about going on trust walks with the mayor of the community, with an Athabasca tribal chief an elder who uh, had rights to the to the land and what breakthrough no matter what committee what workshop what tactic something else happens when we went on trust walks yeah i'm i'm getting to this this understanding that curiosity is no different than any other element of of humanity that you, that you want to raise the capacity for doing okay so mm -hmm. curiosity is a choice that we make because you can be you can choose to be closed minded and critical and judgmental just as you can choose to open your heart to the possibilities by being more curious and and asking more questions and, and you know i mean the the theme of our podcast is everything through the lenses of love and compassion and empathy right and i'm seeing curiosity as an extension of that um, where for us to grow as human beings, we, it's hard to do that without being curious. Now bring that to the systemic level and you can impact organizations, communities in the world. Uh, it is, it, it's a fascinating topic for me. Um, 
Okay. Yeah. Do you mind if I offer a quick thing? You know, when you, yeah. it's interesting though when you say, uh, I mean, I just love the exchange. I, you're, you're, you're nerding me out. I hope you don't mind. Um, <laughs> well, Philly's mutual. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I think it's interesting that you use the word choice, right? You can choose to be curious. You can choose to be empathetic, right? And I do think that is absolutely true. And I wonder if part of what I was mentioning earlier, that some of that prevention of curiosity is systematic, right? Mm. We do need to, in order to embrace that empathy, that love that I, I, I when I took, uh, when I looked at your uh, podcast, when we first found one another, uh, I, I love that love is a leading framework. I, I have a hypothesis that t- two thoughts. One, that sometimes when the preventative measures of curiosity are systematic and it's almost like an IMAX surround sound screen, we may not even know that we're actively not making a choice to be curious because mm-hmm. there are systematic preventions, you know, incentives policies. It's almost in the same way we're becoming more aware of systematic racism and ways in which it is expressed, embedded in systems and institutions. That is also true of curiosity. Mm. There is, it's almost like a kind of diffused proliferation of structures that prevent flourishing the mindset of curiosity. And to your point about um, empathy, which I love, I think curiosity even happens prior to empathy. It's almost like empathy is about seeing someone else's point of view. It's about caring for what they care about, to understand a perspective that is not even yours. But to do that, you have to be curious enough to extend beyond your own self-interest, right? Yeah. So it's almost like curiosity is a gateway drug to get right. to empathy, right? Right. And so Good. to your point, why are we polarized? Almost like saying, why is there not more empathy? Why is there not more love? Well, I'm almost proposing that there's an earlier source code that a variety of layering of prevention of curiosity creates a prevention to even get to empathy and love. Right? Yeah. There's there's your pathway right there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Seth, let's bring this conversation to the leadership side um, Mm -hmm. and and maybe talk about why curiosity is such a central leadership skill. Well, you know, I've been uh, honored to work with uh, extraordinary organizations and leaders. And I think one of the things that I just find fascinating is just how underdeveloped leaders maturation and comfort is when it comes to asking questions, to be curious, to uncover new value. Uh, It is an art and a discipline, right? Um, And I'll give you one anecdote. Uh, I was working with uh, a, a global food and beverage company. And we have these salons, these gatherings where we really embody and express the ideas of uh, radical curiosity. And he was a very senior C-suite executive of this company. And part of their supply chain was that they own and operate all of the coolers in which we as customers purchase their drink, right? And he says, look, this, this cooler, we, we have to own and operate. The, this is a multi-billion dollar cost to our organization. So he said, let me try. I'm learning from you, Seth. I'm joining these salons. Design is an interesting language. Let me try and apply your curiosity design principles. And he tasked a team to figure out how can we lower the cost of these coolers? It's very high cost for our, our corporation." And they brought some engineers, they brought this interdisciplinary team, and they looked at the cooler, and they looked at all the components, and it turns out the most expensive component of the cooler, of course, is like the coolant, the actual engineering tool to keep the drink cold. They said, ah, it turns out we could replace this device, it cost 
$100, we can get it for $90. I mean, I'm making up the number, but you get the general idea. Sure. Now, look, at scale, if we're talking about millions of coolers, a, 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 law, a cost savings of 10% is extraordinary, right? Now, this for me is a kind of, it's a kind of business management. It's like a McKinsey Accenture mindset of, can we look at the existing principles, the existing building blocks? Can we operationalize them more efficiency, efficiently? Excuse me. That is extraordinarily valuable. Could save them $100 million. He says, all right, let me go get a design thinking group. Let me practice in this curiosity. Turns out the highest cost is the question of cold, how cold is made. Let's take the engineering out. Why don't we look at what is what is cold? A very philosophical, ontological, experiential, very design nerdy kind of question. What is cold? I'll, I'll bring it home in a quick second. <laughs> Turns out this team, this like team B, challenger team, yeah. began to research cold. And after a variety of insights, what they came to is that the temperature that the refrigerants were being cooled to was colder than our body would experience any value or nutritional preservation of the drink. So they're essentially overcooling the refrigerant. And once they changed an understanding that the temperature of cold was not creating any value, they changed the temperature, changed the piece, and it went down 50% from $100 <laughs> down to $50. Now, sure, did we need the engineering, the operational, to understand that maybe the highest price of cost was cold? Yes. But then what happens when you take a radically interdisciplinary team, a biologist, a radical curiosity thinker, a philosopher, and say, what is the idea of cold? Turns out you can save not $100 million, but 500 million. And so how do we create space as leaders, as business executives to say, maybe we need to ask questions that aren't even on our radar to either decrease costs or increase value, or if we're talking about nonprofits and cultural organizations, the social impact to communities. Sometimes there, I don't know what kindergarten teacher said there's no bad question. They were lying to us. Right? Yeah, there are good questions, there are bad questions, and there are essential, radical, curious, extraordinary questions where the value creation can be exponential. And I think that origin point of how to zero in and figure out what a great question is to really unleash value, that is the leadership practice of the 21st century. Oh, man, it's exploring what you don't know you don't know. I Does that make that. sense? Yeah. Beautifully said. Okay. One of the... I didn't even need, I didn't even need the, uh, the the anecdote. You just nailed it in a portion. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's the whole anecdote that led me to that conclusion. Right, right. It's like, yeah, that's what it, that's what it is. And and that's that's why exploration, asking questions, getting down to the root, going back to your your analogy of radical being the root of things makes so much more sense now. Right, um, right. So right. one so, of the... So, yeah, go ahead. So just, just real quick to your point. So this begins to, with the anecdote, dimensionalize what really is root, right? So the, hmm. the root is not, do we have the right truck bringing the refrigerator to each store? The root is, what is the purpose of refrigerators? Ah, it is to preserve a nutrient. So what does preservation mean? What is nutritious? What is cold? Why do we make things cold? Does cold give us pleasure? Does cold enable our products to stay long? We have to ask deeper questions. Yeah. And it, a great question can have a billion dollar impact. A parking question for the Committee on Internet of Things has like a $10 impact. Yeah. Yeah. So, Seth, um, I'm going to go back to, I'm going to make a, uh, um, a pop culture reference star wars fans you're gonna love this one okay so but this is like old school star wars back in the empire strikes back uh, i think that was like i don't know 80 81 um yoda is 
mentoring Luke Skywalker, and he says this, you must unlearn what you have learned. And I actually use that quote in a lot of my leadership retreats and 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 uh, speaking engagements, right? To draw the point that you sometimes we have to challenge our, our own thinking about what we think is right. When the world has changed, we're still hanging on to these ideas and ideals from right. 30, 40, 50 backs that are irrelevant now. So you said something that's really interesting. Uh, you say uh, unlearning can be a form of activism. Mm. Yeah, break that down for us. Well, thank God you're a Jedi Knight, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think uh, just to kind of uh, expand on uh, Yoda's <laughs> wisdom, right? I think in this same way, I'm talking about that if the 20th century was an extraordinary accelerant into commercial, technological, and scientific abilities this next century uh, will be us unlearning so many of the assumptions that have guided the business, the civic, the social models that we have left unquestioned, right? We are living in times of great challenges as you and I both, uh, you know, in our, in our prep kind of agreed. Um, but these these challenges will not be solved by making a new product. We don't need another app for that. It's not as though technology is not valuable, but I believe that the great project will actually be decoding, identifying, and resting down and retiring frameworks that no longer are relevant for the times that we live. Yeah, I mean, big abstract things like racism, sexism, inequity, climate change. Here we are in the week of COP27. Our own success is what brought us here. Let's be clear. The 20th century's success has set the bed for the work of the 21st century, right? But in order to successfully step into these wicked and tangled challenges, the complexity of the system's challenges that we face, the work is to unwind the mental model frameworks that we assume are on, on, uh, unmovable, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I have a chapter to your point, I say, education is too big to fail, but maybe it should. Oof. Right? There's so many assumptions. I mean, education is a great one. Here's what I mean about mental model assumptions. If you ask anyone in America, generally, of course, I'm making a big generalization, but if you corner anyone and say, is public education hitting it out of the park? Are we doing the home run for every child in America? Very few people would say, we're killing it. Actually, most people say, oh, if I got stories for you, it's terrible. We need to change everything, blow it up and start over or something like this. And yet another social system, if education is a social system, another social system, justice or crime or policing, will say, we don't believe in education. We, don't th we as a country don't think it's working. But if you don't attend, we'll throw you in jail. It's called truancy. Right. We, we our world is full of these strange paradoxes, right? We're experimenting with money. What is universal basic income? What is cryptocurrency? Does money exist? What is inequity? Gender. Suddenly on Facebook, you can identify with 58 different genders and sexual identities. So many core ideas are getting rewritten. We don't have to make a new product. We actually have to unlearn and unlearning that there are two genders or unlearning that money is if you just work hard. These are all these mythologies that actually activism, which really is just about making change to embrace what is relevant in the new era. That work is a kind of unwinding in our heads. Yeah. How far do you go, though, on that activism before it becomes so radical there's that word again that instead of bringing people 
together, it causes even more division. Well, I I wonder if it's not, it might be about uh, how that unwinding happens, Mm. how that unlearning unfolds. Because I think you can design participatory processes where people are actually building trust by asking questions together. We may still be in that that dichotomy of we don't talk anymore that you referenced several times. We may still find that we have differences, but the way in which we maybe unlearn and unravel uh, some of these legacy narratives, as I call them, the very way in which we do it may allow for difference, but that difference not be about polarization or about anger, right? It might, the very way in which we civically imagine the future together, it's not that every, in fact, I don't want a world in which we have monological beliefs. Yeah, Diversity is wonderful, but diversity that evolves towards anger or polarization, that's not actually diversity of thought. That's something else entirely, right? I think a lot about uh, how this plays out in government and our elected officials' worlds, right? And how those leaders are affecting that polarization that you and I share a concern about. I just wonder, you know, I think this is what I mean about the systematization. Even if we think about how we elect individuals, I mean, we're we're recording this the week of the midterms, right? Yeah, right. And you know, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating sport we call of the elections in America, right? A candidate frames a position. And we, as citizens, listen to the different positions and select and identify and encode ourselves, print ourselves on that position. I'm running for America. This is my position on healthcare. Go to my website, read my bill, read my position. This is the answer. But I don't think our world lives in the construct of answers. I mean, radical curiosity espouses that life is just much more inquiry based. Life is about questions. There might not be one solution to healthcare. There might be many. There might not be one philosophy on infrastructure or public education, these issues. I would love to imagine a candidate who doesn't stand up and say, these are my positions, choose one or the other. But what if the candidate, like what we're talking about, this participatory process I'm imagining, what if a leader were to run on a position saying, I'd love to design a process by which this country explores, experiments, and figures out together the many different ways we could bring greater health to this nation. And maybe the platform is the way to get there, not the answer. Right. Yeah. That would be a very different way for us as citizens to truly, I th- I believe, exercise what I think democracy can be about at its highest order, that civic imagination is that we are all actively authoring the many solutions. The world is too complex. What might work in a city might not work in a rural region. What might work in one region of the country, not in another. What might work for my beliefs, might not in another. Why don't we have a cacophony? Yeah. Of practices. Right. And I imagine in the political sphere, why can't we have a little bit of both sides of the equation coming into policy and what, whether it's domestic or foreign uh, to solve the world's biggest problems? Because both sides have really good things to offer. I mean, that is, uh, as, as, sorry, just because you, yeah. sorry, mm-hmm. you triggered me, but just as we're talking again uh, during COP27 week right now, you and I, the UN doesn't get together and say, well, there's only one way to deal with carbon. There's only one way to deal with temperature. 
there is, a, it's almost like a venture capital model. There is a portfolio of dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of solution strategies that are deployed simultaneously. Why, why do we live in such singularities in American politics and governing, right? I think that's an opportunity that if curiosity were to be embodied in government, diversity and duplicit, uh, not, du not duplicative, but a kind of uh, diversity of simultaneity would allow for the Renaissance. When JFK says, we're going to the moon, they didn't go, well, there's only one way to get there and we're not gonna run 50 experiments. Like, it's just not how progress happens. Yeah, yeah. That's such a fascinating conversation. Uh, this could easily be a three or four hour talk if we allowed it, um, <laughs> but we, we need to wind down. So you end the book with, uh, and you touched on the, the, the 28 building blocks for radical curiosity. I'm wondering if you could just offer us maybe one or two practical strategies for doing just that, for activating our curiosity. One of them that I really love is called Fourth Places. It's one of the 28 building blocks. And Fourth Places is kind of inspired by the sociologist uh, proposition that our society has third places, right? So the kind of framework for those who might not be as, as uh, associated is, the, the concept is that our first places are our home, our family. Second places are our work. Third places, which is a fairly recent idea, like past couple of decades, are those neighborhood associations, those hair salons, those community social capital spaces that bring us together. But I propose maybe adding a next era of that discourse where fourth places might be similar to those third places where social capital, social co cohesion brings us together, but just coming together is not enough anymore. The world is facing much more complex challenges. So I'm imagining that fourth places are organizations or projects or frameworks that bring us together specifically to work on the future, right? And I think we have like there's like the MIT Media Lab or these like very famous iconic institutions, but it's surprising that we don't have more of them. And I think one of the things I propose in the book is that there could be a practice and you could just do it in your own home. It doesn't have to become a whole new university. Might we convene fourth places in our life, in our, is, is that what a dinner party could be? Is that mm. what you know, how you show up and lead your team. How do we don the idea of being a fourth place? Huh. Yeah. Seth, um, as we wind down here, what, what's your ultimate hope for people reading this book? But what I hope people take away is that everything matters. Everything counts. We, we're not just passive vessels. We can decode and see the indicators, those upending indicators of how so much is changing, but it's not just happening to us. We can pull up our sleeves and lean in and be a part of authoring what comes next. And that's extraordinarily optimistic. And I can't wait for the whole century to unfold. Oh, man, that's good. So before I uh, close with our traditional two questions uh, to end the show, I'm really curious. I want to actually plug um something that you have going on called ideas salon tell us a little bit about it what is it well the salons are they're almost kind of like uh theaters for us to put radical curiosity into practice we bring about 50 to 75 people together once a quarter uh and we take on a big theme a big crazy uh wacky ambitious goal what's the future of education what's the future of the military what's the future of cities right and we bring people together who maybe aren't traditionally a part of that topic but would bring fresh eyes to it and we spend three days uh in a retreat environment doing what we kind of call a design hackathon to ideate and imagine breakthrough thinking about a kind of thorny intrinsic problem that has vexed us. And, you know, often they're invite only, but it's interesting. Next year, we're going to start to 
because of the book as the next way to activate readers of the book who are wanting to find ways to put it into practice, we're going to be opening up the doors to salons for the public. Perfect. I want to make that invitation available to, to my listeners at some point. Maybe you and I can chat a little bit about that. We bring it home with two questions, as we do with every guest. Personally, Seth, what's really tugging at your heart right now that you'd like us to know? Yeah, my my focus at the end of this year is around food, actually. Food has become a big passion. I'm very curious about how we will feed ourselves in the future, right? Um, we're starting a variety of new ventures around food uh, from you know, the vertical uh, agriculture to regenerative farming to all these new practices. But I also, for myself, I'm thinking about it for my own and my family and my community's health. I'm, I'm really committed to thinking about redesigning some of those same mental model assumptions about how we eat and what, what we eat and why we're eating. Mm, that's great. Seth, you close us out. As every guest does, what's a, a final thought or a key takeaway to keep this discussion going? Yeah, I just think, you know, um, it's an extraordinary time to be alive, even though every time we look at a kind of journalistic headline, it feels very negative. It feels very challenging. And it is. But I think that's when we'll see uh, the best of us. I think we have an opportunity to really uh, show how radical our curiosity can become. Yeah, and the book title again is Radical Curiosity, and there it is, the cover, if you're watching on YouTube. I'm going to read the subtitle because it's very important as well. Questioning Commonly Held Beliefs to Imagine Flourishing Futures. Hey, if people want to get a hold of you, and I hope they do, I want to send 100,000 people right now to your website. Where can they go? It's uh, curiosityand.company. So rather than .com, the traditional extension, it's curiosityand.company. Thanks for that. Very kind of you. Absolutely. And thanks for joining us. It's been inspiring and enlightening, and we're all better for it. Thanks, Steph. Absolutely. A delight. Great to meet you. Keep the conversation going on social media and comment on this episode with hashtag love in action podcast. And if you prefer to watch the episode, you can also find us on YouTube. And I'm going to have all the stuff, uh, the YouTube embed, all of uh, Seth's info and, uh, you know, how to get a hold of Idea Salon when the invitation comes out publicly on my website in the show, show notes, marcelschwantes.com. And finally, hey, if... Um, if you want to sponsor an episode of this show, we're open to it. You can reach me on my website or find me on LinkedIn. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Love in Action podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please share it, subscribe, and leave us a review. Until next time, don't forget, the future of leadership is love in action. Believe it, practice it, and watch your business grow.